Greetings. Here we are again. Uh, this time, let me begin with my version of taking, taking refuge. I take refuge in the, the super Einstein, super Darwin, the great, greatest scientist that ever lived, the Buddha. And, or let's say even all the Buddhas who are the greatest scientists who ever lived. All the, all the great inner scientists explicitly known as inner scientists, especially in Indian, in the great Indian tradition, but actually being inner scientists in every other cultural tradition, there are some who did that. And Einstein is our latest. And um, so I take refuge in them. I take refuge in the reality that they found out something about and taught us something about based on their direct experience of, the, of some version of that reality. And those who become perfect Buddhas complete understanding of that reality. And uh, that's the definition of a Buddha is a super scientist who completely knows reality by being all of reality. And so I vow to be and take refuge in being realistic, that is to say. And finally, I take refuge in the community of those science, spiritual scientists and material scientists who have the spirituality of even being materialistic in a scientific way of trying to observe things and going beyond any descriptions of them to see a new dimension and a deeper thing about them. I take refuge in those three things. Those are ref that's my refuge in the three jewels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, seen as, as totally present in modern times, rather than just some historical thing thought of as a world religion, which we need now to go beyond, not to lead to a competition of world religions, which His Holiness the Dalai Lama has taught me and others, is something we must avoid to reach, uh, to really appreciate this Buddha land of Shakyamuni Buddha, this beautiful planet, by, and appreciate it by making it, by restoring its natural way of being and by uh, avoiding destroying it, destroying it in some reckless way. Okay? So now we're on page 77. I talked about the, the marvelous discovery of uh, karma as this marvelous evolutionary ethical theory, ethical theory. And now I want to go into more specifics of the ethical under the heading karmic evolution. Karmic evolution, and I will read at first. Karmic evolution is described as what explains the varieties among the forms of beings. So as they say, you know, in the Buddhist text, you look at the ocean of life forms, like any biologist does. And lately they've discovered so much more, like the medical scientists have discovered the microbiome. And there's this amazing thing, just when they were thinking they were getting through genetic analysis and the ability to reconstruct the human genome, and they, which they discovered is about 23,000 potential genes in a human being, they also discovered that there are all these other alien creatures in our stomachs, in the gut, which are the microbiome, where there are millions of beings with all kinds of different genomes than ours. And uh, so we are a community of many different kinds of beings. We find room, we, we're such amazing beings that we have room for all these other beings. And actually, we are the community of them, and we need them in our community to live with them. And by discovering that, we realize that some kind of antibiotic, some kind of poison that is used to heal certain diseases, uh, which on the surface seem to be only healing, are also immensely destructive to some other aspect of essential life of other beings that are live within us and who contribute to our way of being. Uh, so we are, each one of us is like a community, a planet full of beings. It's amazing, really wonderful. So the variety, so you see the ocean of these beings to the micro, and we don't even see the macro universe being the universe where this whole universe is just an atom in a larger universe. This entire universe, not just even just the planet of the solar system, the whole universe, all the stars at the farthest light year distance are simply all of them in an atom in another universe so much huger than this universe, it's beyond our imagination. Why beings are different and why they look different, how they improve and deteriorate. Human siblings and even twins look and are different and have different outcomes in life. 
So, in other words, to account for the differences in beings, it's because each one has an infinite past, and they're subtly different even though there's no limit to the varieties in life. Nevertheless, um, uh, uh, there is a reasonable way to explain how different lives are shaped in different ways within our own can as we examine more at the micro and macro dimensions of how beings live. Or even at our meso dimension, it's immensely complicated and vast and oceanic even. Buddha explained the biology of this with his theory of individual and communal evolution and his declaration of the causes of causal things expressed in his cardinal mantra, which I discussed already in a previous session in a previous chapter, ye dharma hetu prabhavaha hetun tesham tathagata hyabhadat. So the realistic one a uh, truly realistic one declared the causes of those things which are produced from causes. That's what that's that that famous Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava, Om Ye Dharma Hetu Prabhava, Hetun Tesham Tatakata Hiyavadat, Tesham Jayu Nirudo Ivambadi Mahashamani Svaha. Anyway, this is just the first lines. Darwin explained this in his own way. 2,500 years later, by discovering that natural selection via genetic mutations in different environments was responsible for differences in life forms and the destinies of living species. Watson and Crick came up with the double helix pattern of molecular genetic coning only a century, a roughly a century later, just a few decades ago, really. All of these theories give a good basis for explaining the mutations of species on the coarse level of material process, developing a useful biological science. So just because I critique the imprisonment of modern science, the constriction of modern science, by the dogma of the scientistic dogma of materialism, of sort of dogmatic materialism, doesn't mean that I, we, Buddhas of the past, Buddhas of the present, don't appreciate the contributions of materialist scientists to the degree that they follow a methodology of privileging experience and observation over theory and codification. And therefore, they have observed to ever greater and greater detail material processes and have discovered wonderful things, which they have described as best they can, but unfortunately, they just felt because they were still frightened of, the, of, the, of life and are frightened of some invisible force that might put them in a bad state or name because of many centuries of a culture steeped in the idea of an omnipotent deity who has a little bit of a mean streak by creating hell and so on <laughs> and misfortune. And so, uh, but the, what they've observed is immensely valuable. And they will observe, that they, when they take that degree of sophistication and turn it to observe what is going on in the mind and in, in the deep nervous system, not just with treating it as a material thing, but as neuroscience does, like material, a bunch of brain processes and central nervous system processes, but by the mental level of even too, so subtle that it can be philosophically simply considered non-material. But it, of course, it's not. One. It's Im it's embedded in material, of course, and and um, on, but on the other hand, in some areas of theory and some areas of science, because you still have theory, and so then you can judge theory by its use in certain contexts. And in some contexts, it's better to say mind is non-material, because in a way, matter and mind are a binary, and they give meaning by being the opposite of each other, and they, and they and by having them as a binary, you open to, be, to beyond what you can control, the mind-matter interconnection. Okay? You got that? And then, because science, and then that makes you prone to more observation, to being brought up non-dually face-to-face with more reality. When you don't have some sort of theory, idea, description, or a bunch of mathematics, a bunch of weird co codes and secret symbols, what, by which you think you control it and you place that between you and what you're looking at. 
and think I've observed enough because now I have a description. And instead, real science knows that all descriptions are temporary, are hypothetical. They are awaiting, they are awaiting disproof and refinement by further observation. That's truly scientific. And there's a science of looking into the mind, the inner science, into your own mind of the scientist, looking into his or her own mind. And that's the highest, most valuable one. So we can easily see how so useful biological science. We can easily see, however, that this science cannot connect in any predictable way with fundamental physics at the level of the subtlest particle that by observing carefully, they've seen their own imperfection or, or the fact that they cannot become conclusive. They've, they've seen their uncertainty, they've encountered their uncertainty. They've encountered the open-mindedness that's required of, the, of not closing and making theories into dogmas. So it is the amazing fact that to this day, only the Buddha and his successors have been able to take account of and figure in the key role of the subtlest energy levels of individual animals, bodies, and minds. And that's what we would call the soul level. These Buddhist scientists connected beings' minds and mental actions with the epigenetic shaping of their mutations as individuals, let's put it that way, to use some terms of the materialists. They provided plausible ways of tracking their individual migrations via the death-rebirth process, migrating from embodiment in one species to embodiment in another species, as well as moving from one body to another among a single species, different types and environments. They described their individual evolution and devolutions during the beginningless and potentially endless involuntary and unceasing quest of individual sensitive beings for freedom from pain and enjoyment of happiness, which is what every sensitive being is trying to do. Somehow the primary misknowing of the sensitive being having been, when every sensitive being was not, nothing but just the field of infinite bliss energy, somewhere that being had a misknowing of thinking somehow they didn't have all of it. And there was something about them separate from the larger energy. And therefore, then they sort of started, they began to have individuated, separated, separated life. And that's what, that was the fundamental misknowing and, uh, uh, that they did, you know. In the Buddhist case, an individual is charged with creating a karmic evolutionary trajectory through the causal engagements of body, speech, and mind. The causal process itself of individual intentional actions having determinative impact on future forms of life and future experiences of the individual is called karma, which simply means evolutionary causality. In modern terms, the causal processes of mutation of species life forms over generations is commonly called evolution. In both theories, species or individuals can evolve upward toward fitness or flourishing or devolve downward toward extinction or greater suffering. Although unfortunately it's impossible to be fully extinct and it's impossible to have eternal greatest suffering. <laughs> But one can make really, unfortunately, bad suffering by behaving unskillfully and evilly and negatively by killing people and so forth, killing beings and being destructive and so on. His Holiness the Dalai Lama complained to me once that karma theory did not pay enough attention to genes and parental heredity. He specifically was comparing so here he's criticizing his own karma theory, which did not, did not, was not able, did not have the opportunity to incorporate the way that the super subtle genetic molecular analysis, you know, electron microscope developed electron analysis uh, elements with even, even just what they think of as material causal evolutionary forms. And he wanted that to be more, as applied into human thing, it talks about 
heredity, what you inherit from your parents, what you inherit from your environment, from your culture. He specifically was comparing the great fifth Dalai Lama to himself. The great fifth Dalai Lama was an amazing Dalai Lama who lived 1617 to 1682 as the, as the world was moved to modernity by unifying the life world between sort of mentalistic and materialistic. And in the, in the Tibetan sense, they sort of went maybe to a spiritualistic extreme, and whereas in the Western sense, they went to a materialistic extreme in that binary of matter and spirit or matter and mind. So, so but the great fifth unified in the other way. And the, but he said that the great, he was jealous of the great fifth, he admitted, because the great fifth's parents were yogis, Nyingma school tantric adepts, Nagpas, who had psychic powers and were skilled in magical, supernormal perceptions and actions. In other words, they had clairvoyance, they had telekinesis, they had telepathy, uh, which are all normal powers of every human being. Every human nervous system has, gives a human being capable of developing such powers, definitely. And they come naturally when you develop deeper in interiorization through meditation, through, not only through calming meditation, but through an interior analyzing meditation and learning how the whole thing works and mastering the subtler processes of the mind and mind-body processes. And, uh, and so he's saying that that's those skills that the parents of the fifth Dalai Lama somewhat attracted the fifth Dalai Lama's rebirth in, their, in the womb of the, of the, of the parents and, uh, and, to, and absorbing somewhat the knowledge of the father and the mother and therefore naturally being the child naturally having more psychic abilities than and then he the Dalai Lama in the case of the 14th the great 14th Dalai Lama himself his parents were farmers they practiced animal husbandry and they had no such developed spiritual capacities for him to inherit although he's being too harsh on himself I think and on his parents in other contexts he speaks about how his great guru of love and compassion, which is the great essence of his teaching, was his mother. So his mother was highly developed, obviously, in this yogic and spiritual way, although she didn't live as a yogi, but she was extremely generous. She fed everybody in the neighborhood. She was, and she taught him by example, by her interaction with him, the young baby Dalai Lama, those compassion and modeled that compassion, kind of like the mother is the great teacher of everybody, according to Ashley Montague, the great anthropologist, for example, really beautiful studies of that. And those are the basis of the secular notion of the gentleness and kindness of the human being that influences illness as well. His wonderful mother had great compassion, but neither parent had supernormal powers. His holiness thinks, although I'm thinking maybe the mother did have some, actually, but as a woman, the males didn't appreciate it in her day at that time, possibly. But the intuition of women is a supernormal power. And all these telepathy, telekinesis, so-called magical thing, women therefore are closer to that than males. But all yogis develop those. And therefore I never say supernatural, because nature actually includes the supernormal, what, we, what materialists think is supernormal. And that's how I do it. Although even I am still infected. You have to realize, when I talk about things that seem miraculous, seem materialistically impossible and so forth, and I seem to give them credence, it's because I've come to see it that way. I feel it that way. But yet I know, pre pre predominantly, let's say, but I know that still lurking in my psyche is a sense of overconfidence in materiality, over importance of this life only, even though I'm toward reaching near the end of it within the last few decades at best, and or could leave at any time. But of course, that could be any young person too. That could happen to anybody. But I'm like that. But the point is, I, you, this is the way you meditate these things in the in the scientific aspect of the Buddhist education, and that is, you are honest about where you really are yourself, and you. Keep analyzing 
Why do I think that really only this life is important? Why don't I, why don't I feel the immediate presence of a future life when I make decisions about whether I do ethical or unethical things, when I set priorities for what I do in this life? Why, don't I, why do I keep thinking about what I want to get done in this life for the fruits in this life? Why don't I realize that what I'm getting done will give a fruit and then, oh, I want this sort of fruit in the next life. I want it to be like that in the, in the next life, in the next life. Why isn't that just as immediate to me in setting my priorities as gaining something for this life's use? Because I still vestigially have that culture. I'm honest about it. But now my sort of familiarity, I would say, over 60 years of work on it, I've, not to mention previous life, but I've been in this life, my familiarity with this idea that Nature is supernormal as far as materialists go. It's like dark matter, dark energy is showing that to materialist scientists. There's a whole bunch of mass, that means matter, in the world that they didn't see yet. But they've now realized by scientific observation it has to be there because it's controlling the behavior of what they do see. So now they have to all start all over again, try to figure that out. And they don't even see something even more important than that, which is transparent matter and transparent energy, which doesn't have to be only like outside the galaxy or outside the solar system, or maybe somewhere inside the nucleus of the atom, related to the weak force in the Higgs field, but it's right here in the mind. And it's right here in this room. It's transparent matter and energy, infinite transparent matter energy, to be tapped to do for, for supernormality, to, to, to make supernormal good things, okay? To make miracles, in other words. Be able to be open to miracles. So anyway, he was jealous of the fifth who had that. So he feels his parents didn't have that. So although his wonderful mother had great compassion, but neither parent had supernormal powers, so his holiness seemed to feel in that mood dissatisfied with his genetic heritage in this regard, as I am, as I might feel. But why? Because as a great Bodhisattva, His Holiness would really like to, if he had the miracle, miracle power, maybe he could appear to dictator Putin, to dictator Ayatollah, to dictator Maduro, to dictator whoever, or wannabe dictator whoever, you know, some trillionaire dictator, appear in their dream in a way where they're open-minded in a dream and really lead them into understanding how much more fun they would have in not being a dictator, in being really open and really appreciating others and really having their input and really listening to them and et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and not trying to dictate over them and embracing democracy where other people have a say in the way things are handled, and you take advice from them. Maybe still there might be some people have to make decisions. Yes, there will be some in different contexts, of course. But then there you one listens to other people, and one doesn't think really it's absolutely superior to them just because one happens to be richer, better educated, how politically have got elected or something. Well, it doesn't make one superior at all. In fact, it makes them more humble to serve. And they might understand and appear them in their dreams and really stop this ridiculous, purely destructive wars. He gets frustrated at that. He, he, you know, and so far, our siddhas have not stopped all of that. Complete, maybe they, actually, I'm sure they've stopped a lot of them that, you know, that almost blossomed into that terrible kind of genocidal violence. But not all of them. And then, there's, then Great Bodhisattva will be frustrated about that. So therefore, he thinks maybe if he was fifth all of my life now, <laughs> he could have done some magic. Because the fifth all of helped to create a great piece of modernity in Central Asia and prevented wars between Mongolians and Chinese and Tibetans and Persians and whoever during his time. And the Westerners had enlightenment at that time to start getting even the Westerners, the big colonial conquerors, to begin to start something counter to their domination determination. Okay, in the same way that the fourth, great 14th, His Holiness the great 14th Dalai Lama is bringing scientific understanding into conversation with Buddhism, it would be a big shift for scientists to consider karma theory to overcome their bias against rebirth or reincarnation 
and to realize that mind is part of life and is itself a force in nature and that they live in a much bigger environment in time as well as space. In a way, you, sometimes you hear people say we live in four dimensions, three of space and one of time. But there's not just one of time because we don't live all the time in the present, actually, contra those people who want to be in the eternal moment. The internal moment means a moment that includes all of past and all of future. So there's actually three dimensions we live in in time, that, but just they're invisible, so we don't think about them like space with X, Y, Z. So we don't think that right now, uh, what it, the, the existent past in the in, invisible temporal dimension is affecting what's going on here. The invisible future is being affected on by what's going on here, and actually indirectly, therefore, is affecting what's going on here. In a way, since the effect of... Uh, in a way, the effect influences the cause beyond our ability to describe, a simple linear thing. And so we actually live in six dimensions. So if they want to go further, they have to go beyond six. That's really important to realize. And a Buddha does. That's why they say in a Buddha, a Buddha is present in all of their past, and their present includes all of their future, even infinite future. And it includes all of other beings' infinite futures. And that makes the Buddha very impatient that others should not suffer infinitely. They don't want them to suffer infinitely. Although they're willing to stay infinitely to help them not do so, if necessary. But they, they, don't, they, they feel impatient to help anybody who's suffering get out of it, like a doctor does. Our patient is in misery in front of the doctor. The doctor is impatient to see them cured. Of course, and we'll figure, try to invent anything to heal them that they can, any kind of doctor. So that's wonderful. And, and by the way, there is a wonderful book called Mind and Cosmos by a wonderful philosopher called Thomas Nagel, who may be semi-retired or maybe senior philosopher at NYU, New York University, and who, in this book, Mind and Cosmos, he tried to, he created a sort of path of reasoning, trying to help materialist biologists realize that without taking into account first-person testimony and studying the mind in itself and therefore studying their own minds, becoming yogis to study their own minds, that they would not succeed in improving their biological sophistication and how to affect and develop uh, better beings and help beings become better. So, and he's, he said that the reason that they, and he, he allowed that one of the reasons that materialist scientists don't do that is they think if you allow mind back in, then, God, then a monotheistic God comes back in and starts sending people to hell and doing things which they're scared of, rather than that there'd be a way that there'd be specific causal processes about certain acts of any kind of being, not just some God, that are part of the biological equation of developing beings and species even. And that will make so much more excellent their biological theory. Okay, workings of the inner, under, now under the heading of workings of the inner science-based biology, how it actually works. Scientists need to acknowledge that whatever their theories of the causalities that shape life may be, they affect how humans think of themselves. What they think their life is and what their life purpose is, and what they think their best choices are to do with their lives and energies. So that's the sort of, even though you think that your law of nature or your big evolutionary theory has an elegant element to it that will maybe inspire people to feel connected to nature, which I think they do, and they think that the theistic people are... Um, or just it's some blanket thing, God's supposed to take care of it all, you know, so that's very simplistic, they think, and they're right. But the point is, if you can bring back the mind, or this subtle and super subtle elements in nature, in your theory of nature, you then might be able to help people. The elegance of your theory and the use and the pragmatism of your theory might be that it would help people set their priorities for life and find the purposefulness of their life. The, the horrible thing about having placed nothingness as God is that people's life becomes meaningless, their life becomes purposeless, 
whatever good they do dies with them. So they might as well be bad if they can get away with it to sort of seem they think have more fun, etc. Whereas actually you have more fun when you're more aware of that, when you're more committed to others through time. So you're living through time as well as through space. And then when you do that in specific choices, and you connect, therefore, what, the way people live with what they think, their theory about what biology is, you are doing them a great favor, and science is bettering human beings. While you also look up and discover more subtle things, fine. If they think they are nothings, and their lives are meaningless, they will live recklessly and randomly, which will tend to be destructive and will tend to depression which is an epidemic in this planet, which is good for the pharmaceuticals who produce antidepressants if they really completely work, but they don't. So the greatest antidepressant, antidepressant is to realize your own, to fall in love with yourself, as a, to realize, appreciate what you are as a miraculous human being with an intelligence and a mind and a heart and a loving capacity for love. That's what makes you not depressed. Your spirituality helps. If they think they are not, oh yeah, so they will be returned to depression. If they realize that every relative thing has cause, is caused by something, something, and serves as cause for something else, even its own deterioration, they will be more careful about what they cause and will use such a viewpoint to analyze with greater care what it is that brought them to the effects they experience now. What, what is, what's caused me? When you say it's all been random mutation, then there's, it's a crapshoot. There's nothing, there's, there's no, it all got here with no reason at all. It's just, a, it's just a random thing. It's just an accident that you're here and it has no point in meaning and you have no guarantee you'll ever be. Actually, you, well, they try to guarantee you won't ever be here again. But you, except you'll be anesthetized. That they do also guarantee you as a good, as a selling point for marketing. They market the absolutely unrealistic idea that something can become nothing, the word meaning not a thing, not a place, not a destination, therefore. But they market that irrational blind faith requiring theory to you by saying, well, you won't feel any pain. Even if you feel pain and depressed in life because there's no point in life. If anesthesia is the best thing you can get, since you can't get that, that's close enough to bliss for you, rather, because it's no pain, then, they, then, they, then you don't do anything to contribute to the bliss that awaits you of enlightenment, of really knowing who, what you are and what other people are. I mean, this is a total, exponential, inconceivable bliss. And they rob you of that possibility. You simply settle for anesthesia even though it's completely irrational to expect it, because nothing is not anesthesia. No, no something can go into nothing. So it can't anesthetize a something, which is you. Your process, of your mental process, or your physical process, it cannot be anesthetized by nothing. It takes an anesthetic, which is something. Opium, or whatever. That's the opium of the people, not some not some spiritual idea. So, uh, I'm reminded, yeah, they brought the, the greater care, what it is that brought them the effects they experience. So then they'll put, if they realize that the human being, the human embodiment, its, its vulnerability, the softness of its skin, the lack of aggressive, uh, aggressive capacity without inventing some aggressive machinery, and so on, compared to tigers and gorillas and things, and saber-toothed tigers. And so, uh, so therefore, those things made them better than animal, and have more mastery, and the ability to communicate with other human beings and develop group minds through speech. So then the one will, will prioritize cultivating those things that made them rise from being a lesser animal, which are not the normal, expected, environmentally aggressive and isolated things alienating things. I'm reminded of the sociologist Michelle Alexander, intrepid author of the new Jim Crow, studying the horrible racist thing in America, of the prison system and et cetera, et cetera, 
who about you know the fact that the high percentage of black males incarcerated in the United States compared to the population percentages due to keeping them in un poor educated and poorly poor health places who wrote recently that the that she wished people did believe in their own future lives as then they might behave less cruelly and irresponsible to one another and then she said that i was amazed in spite of the fact that she acknowledged that she herself didn't have a belief she was honest and she said oh, she didn't believe in a future life being therefore a card carrying sociological scientific member of the human of our materialist community but she wished people who she sees from her studies behaving so cruelly toward people they think of as lesser people that she wished they believed in future lives whether theistic or not theistic whether monotheistic or infinitheistic thankfully one can't say realistically that any individual can become a nothing even in the commonly accepted theory of material energy there is the thermodynamic law of the conservation of energy that is no energy ever can become nothing it simply becomes diffuse in a in a space by entropy that's what entropy means it, it just scatters itself where it doesn't seem to be anything because it's out there but that's not becoming nothing it will then recombine in some kind of big bang in a way the physicists are involved in bangs you know the scientists so there is no final end to anything no landing in a supposed nothing this is my favorite carlo rovelli physicist who is studying white holes which are where things go from black holes since black hole is kind of a fantasy of some things being mass being compressed into nothingness the extreme form of a black hole belief would be that everything can become the whole universe all the mass will be compressed into nothingness by going into a black hole so but better physicists are beginning to see through that so there's no landing in a supposed nothing of energy just as there is no primal origination of everything from another supposed nothing so the early forms of big bang basically said well we can't tell what it came from everything was sort of nothing and then there was this inconceivable explosion because of course it was unconsciously the guy who first did the math of the big bang was a jesuit priest in a Jesuit University in Holland, uh, Leiden, I think, and so he and then the Pope called for a big press conference to say that science has now validated Genesis, <sighs> and the guy called up the Pope and said, "Don't do that. I want them to take it just on the merits of my mathematical theory, and not think that I'm somehow trying to make science fit with religion." And so he called off the press conference. But that's a, those are facts, historical facts. Among other, all the things that mind, the mind, among all the things, the mind is some sort of entity. It has some sort of energy, and its different phenomena have causes, which go backward in time in infinite aggression, regression, to the beginningless, and which cause something further going forward into the future. So in a way, and it's very this whole infinite regression thing is gets you over, the, you get over the whole problem of what, where, why is it all here? Where did it all come from? Which is sort of the primal curiosity that every sort of dominating dogmatic theory in history, religious or scientific, tries to pretend to the population that they know where it all comes from because that's what kids keep asking. That's where curiosity goes. However, if curiosity opens itself up to the fact that there's no first beginning of something, nothing, anything, whatever you want, mind, matter, whatever you want to call it, that there is a beginningless past of life, that life is infinite in the past, in time as well as space, the life force, then one, one becomes open to the infinite future. And that life will go on infinitely and death will just be doorways between different embodiments when it becomes open to that magnificent view of life and of reality and and which has a very scary element because if you if you're having a miserable miserable time you really want to find out why you're having a miserable time and you want to find out why is that and you don't you just you can't say i came from nothing and blame nothing 
You can't blame God because you don't think he created it all or he, she, or it, or whatever. You have to look at what's going wrong. What am I continuing to do wrong now? What have I done right and what have I done wrong up to now? Beginninglessly, and why now can I really have the opportunity to think that through? And what advice do I have from the best scientists, not the ones who, do, who are in some dogmatic, uh, for, uh, captured in some dogmatic theory? And when one realizes that, one becomes ready to take responsibility for understanding and to therefore doing things that would make the future better because it's going to be endless. That's why that woman wished other people who were cruel and mean to people that they would believe at least future life, because maybe future life, I'll be black. Future life, I'll be the lower person in some caste system. And then I wouldn't want to be treated like that. So why am I treating them like that now? Maybe what goes around comes around. Without some religious theory about it, we all know what go, who, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. We know that all of that's common sense. So among all the minds, it has some sort of energy. So the mind continuum becomes an infinite process also. And minds, like bodily forms, arise and decay and mutate into other forms of mental experience and even into other physical embodiments. There is no such place as nothing into which they can go or from which they can come. It is not an empty space, not a location. Nothing is precisely the word that lands nowhere, has no referent. So it's simply a negation of anything, and there's no way that, that an affirmation of anything can land on a negation. They, it can be affirmed as, as, as a binary opposite of all our words for some things, because there is no something in it. But that means that we can't then pretend there's a referent for it where, where we can actually go and be something in nothing. Otherwise, we're just babbling meaninglessly, right? Nothing means nothing, so it's not a source and it's not a destination. So it's precisely the word that lands nowhere, has no referent. There is no there, there, and it cannot be a destination, right? Such is the most plausible, rational explanation of mind. Mind is part of nature, mind is part of biological process, it shapes material forms and is shaped by them. It is simplistic and dogmatic to insist that matter is the only thing, and mind is just an illusion produced as the brain's epiphenomenon. This is completely irrational. Minds can make choices to drop bombs, minds can decide to kill or save lives, but they actually don't exist? This is ridiculous, purely dogmatic, not even sensible and certainly unscientific. You know, I'm quoting what they say, you know. Minds can make choices to drop bombs. Minds can decide to kill or save lives, but they actually don't exist. <laughs> this is, it's not just, you can't just say the subconscious did it, because the subconscious wouldn't know how to connect itself to some, some material you know, process of a bomb or a life-saving activity. So anyway, those are ridiculous ideas. So we can imagine that the only way to be truly secure is to somehow relax the mind into an open state called an awakened being, a perfectly involved, evolved being, vibuddha and prabuddha, awakened and enlightened being, a being that has opened to feel that all reality is her his or its body, and therefore care for all reality and all life and all other living beings, just like we care when we're semi-sane, we care for our own body. And we can further imagine that such a Buddha being would be inexhaustible in drawing from the infinity of relativity, the energetic creativity to enfold any beings who experience themselves as stressed or suffering or even extremely tormented in the very same awareness of their own primal, infinite, free-flowing bliss that a Buddha being, time, being timelessly enjoys. So this then enables one to begin to try to focus the imagination against all that we expect in our materialistic acculturation, modern, modernistic acculturation, 
if we really open up to the infinity in six dimensions, in space as well as three dimensions of time, uh, and, and particularly we're looking now at the future and at the far distant in space and at the far future. And in seeing that, it then if we have infinite time, who is to say that we could not become an infinite being? Since clearly, logically, that's the best way to be within such an infinite framework. Because an infinite being could co would congregate and aggregate all the infinite bliss that's in that universe and would be a source, therefore, of the healing of the of suffering of all li of the infinite suffering of all living beings. And then this leads one into uh, uh, to two places. In one place, it leads one to the fact that all explanations are finally explode or they finally stop at the ineffability and inconceivability of reality. That while you can experience re reality fully, you can't describe it fully. So they're just attempts almost poetically to describe. Because then if you say infinite bliss then there, and also infinite suffering, and the bliss is just the Buddha's ability to overwhelm that infinite suffering in space and time. But if in a way the suffering remains infinite, the bliss remains infinite, then somehow uh, it doesn't work because you want to come, you want to definitively end all the suffering. You don't want the suffering to be infinite. You want so then I had a formula that I like within that infinite thing, which is that suffering is arise from beings' alienation from others. And therefore, e whereas each alienated being wants to either consume all others or destroy all others to be feel safe because they feel different from them. So the primal aggression, thanatos, the primal lust is either, the primal lust is to connect and consume all beings, to em embrace them, you know, incorporate them all, or to destroy them all. And and uh, that's the primal, uh, pr primal thing, and uh, so each so there's infinite suffering of beings who are all concerned that they should be able to destroy infinitely and consume infinitely, but the enlightened being has become infinitely loving, and they want to yes have infinite. They want to be infinite, and they want to be infinitely blissful, which would mean enjoy the bliss of everything and they want to be infinitely um, you know uh, free which means sort of destroy anything that's not free destroy any bondage of any kind so they have all those desires but the simultaneous in order to have them they also want every other being to be that way so the energy of doing wrong of the infinite suffering beings is what is one infinity. Each one has a singular infinity that they are seeking. But the the Bodhisattva, the, the Buddha, has infinite infinities. So infinite infinities are greater than finite infinities, one infinity. Okay? Infinity to infinity to the power of the infinity. Just make it sound mathematical is greater than one infinity. That's my foolproof, patented uh, mathematical formula of why the good is more powerful than the bad. Okay? But of course, the problem there is there's no such thing as one infinity because oneness has no meaning except as the opposite of zero in one direction as the opposite of two-ness in another direction. So never mind. But it's comforting anyway, that, that mathematical formula of mine. Okay. So we can imagine, yeah. So a perfectly evolved being, a Buddha, a being that is open to feel that all reality is its, body, its his or her body. And we can further imagine that such a Buddha being would be inexhaustible in drawing from the infinity of relativity, the energetic creativity to enfold all and any beings who experience them themselves as stressed or suffering or even extremely tormented in the very same awareness of their own primal, infinite, free-flowing bliss that a Buddha being timelessly enjoys. 
So now, given the scale running from most extreme constriction to infinite, I guess it has to do with, and you should, we should introduce at that point the idea of illusoriness and the, the illusion or illusoriness of suffering of the relative world is really important here because finally the, the Buddha being understands the beings who are suffering as think as being deceived into their suffering because their own reality always has been bliss of freedom of clear light because they all have an infinite Buddha nature within their uh, primal awareness but they they simply have covered their primal awareness with a kind of shield or 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 covering a plastic covering where they don't they just feel alienated from them, their own innermost self as well as from all others. And therefore, but that's an illusion that they are because they are not, there's no way to be alienated from something that's infinite. They're all infinite already. <laughs> okay, so the illusion thing is very important here. So now given the scale running from most extreme constriction to infinite expansion, from agony to bliss, our evolutionary purpose seeking, seeking secure happiness becomes how to evolve toward the bliss and away from the agony. There are innumerable formulations, of course, but very useful are what are called the tenfold paths of positive and negative karmic evolutionary actions of body, speech, and mind, ranging, ranging from coarsest to finest, most subtlest. Skillful action is ethical or virtuous action that benefits both self and others, and unskillful action is unethical and vicious and harms both self and others. Still, skill in virtue becomes skill in evolutionary progress. The ultimate skill, of course, is to go beyond unconscious, instinct-driven evolutionary action and to act only consciously, only wisely, only lovingly, only intuitively to benefit all beings by introducing them to the reality ocean of nirvanic bliss. The way to get there, though, is to follow the tenfold path of positive evolutionary action and avoid the paths of negative evolutionary action. Navigating karmic evolutionary action. This is the next heading. And now finally we're getting down to specifics. There is a story that which I will end with this story and just listing them and then I will come back in the next ones to going more in detail on sort of expounding them. There is a story that in a previous life of the Buddha he received a set of teachings from a great sage, some previous Buddha, that would be whether he was called a Buddha, depending on which phase of history that was in, whether he would be called a Buddha or a Rishi or a sage or whatever, who, or a mystic or whatever they want to call him, who wanted him to value them so much that he demanded the Bodhisattva, the enlightening hero that the Buddha was in that life, use his own skin as a sheet of paper make a quill pen from one of his own finger bones and write down the pattern of the tenfold path with his own blood for ink. <laughs> the sage, the, I really bleed to get the teaching. The sage then recited the negative ten and positive ten together, which the Bodhisattva wrote down in the briefest shorthand he had skin in the game, you could say, so worked for brevity. To put the unskillful and skillful evolutionary actions together, which is probably the form in which he tried to write it on this little bit of skin and this with the blood and the pen, sharpened bone, to put the unskillful and skillful evolutionary actions together, the three Unskillful and skillful bodily actions are one, not taking lives away from other beings, but saving the lives of other beings. So the negative one would be to take life, the positive one is to save their lives. Okay, that's the most primal one. 
not taking what is not given to you of the property of other beings, giving everything to other beings. That is the opposite. That's the, the negative is, is taking what is not given from others. And the best positive is giving everything to them, being generous, able to give everything. And then the negative, unskillful evolutionary act is not engaging in harmful sexual interaction with other beings and engaging in only beneficial sexual interaction. Means one thinks, phew, what, that means there is some beneficial type. <laughs> Usually that third one, in the simplistic way, is put as not commit adultery, like the Western commandment. But that's just, that's just in the specific social context of monogamous culture. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean necessarily that that is the case, but it just means that harmful is loving and caring. I mean, non-harmful or beneficial is loving and caring, and harmful is, is um, causing harm by recklessness, using the other as some sort of object, you know, uh, as not considering their sens sensations, their feelings, their consciousness in the in the intertwining with them. And that's considered a deep negative thing because the sexual thing for living beings in the desire realm, where there you have genetic, uh, you have uh, uh, gender diversity, is um, uh, uh, is using a time, uh, and that kind of diversity relates to creating new beings in some way. and. That cannot happen without the two coming together, in other words. And so at that time, there's a natural selflessness experienced in the ideal male-female interaction at any level of, of uh, embodiment. Okay, so to be harmful still in that thing where you're supposedly giving yourself to the other is therefore a grave, physical, unskillful evolutionary act. And giving yourself totally, even if you don't happen to have another, but sort of giving the, giving the female side to the male side, even yourself, or giving the male side to the female side in yourself. And being a living, harmonious balance of male and female in itself is, is beneficial sexuality. Okay, then, the, then there are four skillful and unskillful evolutionary actions in the realm of speech. Because speech is this more subtle than bodily, but speech is a level of life, because in, this, in the world of language, there is speech. And speech is what constitutes the world of language, from poetic mantra to sort of analytic um, scientific categorizations and things. That's all the realm of speech. But speech is that where living beings interact, they create a, 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 a field of total interaction with each other through speech, by speaking and listening, even even where a being is a monkey or something and only can grunt or howl or a wolf to howl, they're still having a language of some kind. And so that's a speech, that's where the, in a species people interact in speech. So then the negative, unskillful one is lying. Positive one is being realistic in informing others of what you know to be reality. And you may not know fully the reality of yourself, but at least what you think is the actual reality, as much as you've experienced it, you share that right away with someone, and you don't create a false reality to imprison them and to deepen their own alienation from reality. So that's because, and that's very powerful in speech. And then you don't speak divisively to make beings antagonistic to each other. You speak diplomatically, or you speak reconcilingly which you try to get people not to conflict and become a, be alienated, but you try to make them less alienated of each other. Then you don't speak harshly to them to use the, what, the way you can turn their mind into fear and so on, and, and abusively, don't speak abusively and harshly to them. You speak sweetly to them. And, so the, and the ultimate sweet speech is to sing a song, to, and therefore Taylor Swift, for example, was speaking most sweetly to thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And that's the best kind of speech. And Buddha's speech supposedly has those melodies. They call him having the six, they call a Buddha voice, has the 60 mel melodic qualities of the voice of Brahma, the supreme deity of the form realm. 
um, although not the creator of, the, of all three realms, but, this, but the most powerful being in the form, uh, other than Buddha, in the being in the form realms, Brahma, the Brahma voice, they call it. And not babbling pointlessly instead of not gossiping or not, that's blasphemy in the theistic form, very similar to, but here it's not particularly blasphemy, it's just babbling pointlessly. In other words, going on, blah, 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 when you actually have no idea what you're talking about, but capturing people's minds in a bunch of meaningless drivel is also negative, and positive is speaking meaningfully, using the opportunity of sharing minds with others to convey things that are beneficial to them, and yourself even, because you listen to yourself as you speak to others. So learning through speaking yourself, in fact, as well, is speaking meaningfully. So those are the four speech level, and those are very powerful. In a way, you can kill with speech, you can save life with speech. You can, you can rob of speech, and you can give with speech. And you can use sexuality harmfully with speech, and you can create beneficial sexuality. Uh, I, the idea there is such a thing as beneficial sexuality through speech. So, those are, so, so you can see how they are powerful, since in a way, bodily is just as much, as much as you can do with your one body. Whereas with speech, you could get many people to kill. Like some, like dem some demagogue who speaks violently to cause a war, a civil war, or to cause violence in a society is, is doing uh, that, uh, speak, that, that's extreme divisive speech, and so on. So anyway, so the, then the three, so, so now the most powerful is the mind. And the three unskillful and skillful mental actions are not hating, because hating is that primal, comes from that primal aggression, thanatos, the primal murderousness that Freud discovered in the unconscious, but it's the, it's the sort of primal unconscious reaction to the alienated being that if they see something, they presume that something coming at them wants to harm them, so then they want to destroy that thing. So that's a mentally hating, will end up in mentally killing the enemy, and the opposite is mentally forgiving and loving even the enemy and uh, all beings and that saving their lives and appreciating their lives and realizing that they like their lives. And then, but it's not silly and dogmatic. So some being that is using their life to take others' lives and thereby creating a hell-bent destination for themselves, uh, an enlightened being might want to stop them from doing that. And the ideal Buddhist way to catch a murderer is to catch them and then chain them down in some way or pin them down where they can't harm anybody else and even they can't harm themselves. And then interminable teachings, <laughs> interminable lectures, like just teach them, make them more realistic, let's say, by having to become edu educate them in a way. That, they, of the, that the harm they are doing is in their own, against their own self-interest. Get them to understand that, and every being that can understand language will be able to understand that. So that's the ideal, but then in some cases it may involve that you can't chain them down. There may be defensive violence might be involved, so non-violence, and that non-violence might save many other lives, might even save very negative future lives of the one who is doing the killing. So it's not simplistic, the nonviolence thing. Then not coveting, which means not think of how to rob some other people, but being detached and generous, being cultivating generosity to be detached from all of what is your own property, including your own good qualities, your own knowledge, you know, gen you know being mentally generous. A good teacher is mentally generous. They're not trying to keep something secret so they can get a bigger salary from some other people. To, teach, to share with them some useful thing that they keep secret and so on, what they call the closed fist of a bad teacher. Buddha specifically says to all the monastics and all the lay students of him and all the spiritual students of him, the other preachers and, that he always teaches, he says, I've taught you everything that I know, but like the, and, he, and I don't have the closed fist of a bad teacher, he said. And then, but then he said he picked up a handful of leaves and he said, but on the other hand, what I've been able to pick up with my hand to, have, to hand to you are as many like these leaves, whereas as many teachings and reality as there are in the universe are as many as all the leaves in the forest. So I don't pretend I've taught you everything. 
It was quite a marvelous moment in, in a, one of the sutras. So then finally, not being the, the final one, which is interesting, not being unrealistic, but being realistic and wise. So, so not being unrealistic would mean not holding an unrealistic ideology, which is a kind of absolutism or an absolutistic nihilism that, uh, that, that makes you, imprisons you in a universe that doesn't exist. It imprisons you in a psychotic world that you have created out of your own misknowing rather than the real world. So in that sense, imprisoning yourself in an unrealistic worldview. That's the equivalent of bad sex. <laughs> That's funny. The not hating, forgetting is like killing or saving life. Not coveting and being generous is like not stealing and being and giving. And but then not being unrealistic and being realistic is the mental equivalent of bad sex and good sex. <laughs> Uncaring and violent and exploitative sex versus caring and loving sexuality. I think that's really fun. It means being open-minded, in other words. Being, being not, not imposing your idea on another one, but being open-minded to, to open to experience and, and best, basically identifying with the other while interacting with them. So I think that's mainly, now I finally come to this tenfold path, and I want you just briefly to notice at the end of that part uh, how you know, it fits actually with the Ten Commandments. If you know something about Indian civilization, it fits with the laws of Manu and with all Hindu ethical theories. But it's a little different because things like uh, babbling pointlessly versus speaking meaningfully, to them speaking meaningfully is worshipping the Creator. You know? So then the opposite is blasphemy and this kind of thing. But this is not like that. And so, uh, um, so it has, it's a little different. Uh, and, uh, but it's sort of the same framework, which is wonderful. And you can, you can uh, and I had many, as an academic teacher, I had many comparative essays by students over there assigned, you know, and they, where they, 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 they measured the tenfold path from the Buddha with the uh, different legal systems and eth religious ethical systems of other traditions and so on, and legal systems of secularity. And it's very, very valuable sort of thing. And it's a wonderfully valuable thing. But in knowing this, then you see, and then, the, then finally, I just want to say, which I will elaborate more on the next one, but I just wanted to say for today that, that um, the word for virtue and for sort of meritorious act, sort of positive action, evolutionary action or karmic action, evolu karmic evolutionary action, the word for the positive one, kushala in Sanskrit, it's not quite the same necessarily in its translation in other languages, and definitely not so much in English. But that word kushala can also mean, it can mean virtuous, and it can mean like in, in a sort of ethical setting, but in a context, a scientific setting, it means skillful. So in the, in the scientific, biological, evolutionary, th ethical theory, Skillful doing good is skillful because it benefits you and others and it engages reality in a way that benefits you and others. So it's actually, so the, so the good is skillful. That's wonderful. Whereas we might think the skillful is the most exploitative, what can, you can get out of it, something like that, you know, because you have to maximize utility in this life only and then that's all ultimately meaningless. So, so skillful just has to do with exploiting material entities, you know, and quantities like money and uh, and uh, and uh, you know uh, the the domination of people and status among them and all this kind of thing. So, so whereas evolutionarily skillful means how to benefit yourself and others as a form of life and how to therefore be skillful in evolving into being a greater being, and that's vir naturally virtuous because of the, of the reality of the thing. So it becomes realistic to be kind and to realistic to be loving and compassionate rather than just an arbitrary choice. It becomes realistic. And then, and then we get away from the very bad misunderstanding that has come along with the idea of enlightenment, that an enlightened being can be mean and nasty if they feel like it and they can do anything they want and blah, blah, blah. And the people don't, don't care or people just accept the abuse. No, an enlightened being is the, the you, by their fruits ye shall know them. Nice statement, I think, by, uh, attributed to Jesus. 
which means how an enlightened person behaves will let you know whether or not they are enlightened. If they harm other people, they are not enlightened, you can know, because they are not following evolutionary ethic, nor are they setting an example of evolutionary ethic to others. So what has happened is an enlightened being loves evil beings, even demons, as much as they love angels and, and, and good beings. And maybe even like the pro prodigal loves the evil one more because it needs more love because they're being so stupid and self-destructive as well as destructive of others. But, but that doesn't mean they tolerate their evil behavior. It doesn't mean they, they imitate their evil behavior, no. It, it, it means they might put effort into turning that evil behavior, yes, by showing that they can be, because evil beings are often evil because they think that evil is the strong force of the world. And so the good force of the world, the loving being, the Buddha, can show that, can, wants to show that, be, be overwhelmed with the form of their power, so that the evil being suddenly realize their power seems minor compared to the power of the goodness. And they will show a fierce form, that that's, the, that's the fierce tantric deity that you have, you know, the yamantaka, the, the killer of death, you know, the death of death type of form. And um, that's all to the good. And I'll go much more about that later. But it doesn't mean that the enlightened one can just get away with it all. It does not mean that. They kill it. Actually, maybe in a way they could, but they don't. Because it's, they have no motive to do so. Because they, not, they don't have anything more that they need. They're totally satisfied. They're blissed out. So they have no need to do something bad to get something out of it, if you follow me. All that they ever do after that is to benefit others. So they're never going to be harmful to them, even if they sometimes might be forceful in some case with a negative person. Okay? So that's at that point I just wanted to make. And so that's it for this uh, session. Thank you so much for joining and participating. And thank you for giving me the excuse to relook at what I wrote and to elaborate and to give comment on it, because I see it more deeply and learn it more when I, when I speak it. So I'm really grateful to you for that. So by the virtue of this, may we all quickly become Manjushris or Taras, if that's you prefer, whatever you want to be. And so that, but not just for ourselves, that also for ourselves, but in order that we can then help others become Manjushris and Taras as quickly as possible.